you would think that after you're done with the, the one year program, any exchange program, at the end of it, at least in my head, I was thinking, okay, I'm going to be done with it and I'm just going to be fluent. Just like there is this particular sort of uh, time frame type of thing where, okay, done with the program, check mark, fluent, or like near native, check mark. And it just doesn't happen that way. I feel like I, for example, didn't have much time to actually watch a lot of movies in English while I was in New Mexico, while I was in, in the US studying. Yeah. Just didn't have the time to do it, was too busy with other things. So a lot of, I think, a lot of my fluency um, acceleration or whatever you want to call it, it happened actually after the program too, because I tried to keep staying immersed. I had this big goal, like I told you at the beginning, to uh, get accepted to a college in the U.S. So that just really, really pushed me um, to, to keep practicing. Yeah, I see. And to enter this university, you mm -hmm. need a, a TEFL certificate, or I don't know exactly which certificate, but yeah, but it's pretty tough, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you need uh, TEFL or IELTS uh, scores. You also need, in my case, so you needed the SAT or ACT scores which is like doing math or other stuff in, in, in English, you know? So you have to know like the specific jargon of like how they do math in the States uh, or how they, you know, call some of these, uh, even like English language things. How do they call it in, uh, um, I guess, American English? Because SAT and ACT are, um, you know, American tests. But that was another thing that was motivating me for sure to, to stay on track and this is like a pro tip a lot of people what they do is at the end of their exchange program they take that uh, standardized test in english if their you know exchange program was in an english-speaking country they take the toefl right at the end uh, yeah, of the I program see. because because they think that they're like at sense. a peak yeah. level you know yeah i think it works for a lot of people and may I ask you, when you watch mm -hmm. a series or a movie, do you still have troubles in understanding some little bits? I do. I do. I, I certainly do. I still, uh, for the most part, add subtitles to the movies, if, if it's an option. Um, yeah, sometimes there's regional dialects that I don't of really, don't really um, have much experience hearing. For example, I'm lucky that I went to school, to, to my college. Uh, it was in Kentucky. And a lot of the people in, at my college were from kind of the southern area of the United States, from, you know, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, uh, the Carolinas, you know, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee. And, and I got used to hearing that accent. And... Mm -hmm. um, and it's very different from how they speak in New Mexico, for example, or California sure. or New York. <laughs> so um, it's really cool. And if you are somebody who just loves languages, who is just like, you know, passionate about it, then you're, you, you really appreciate these kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. It's and fun. And I don't know, you became an English teacher at at a certain point but but of course before that i i think you were a business analyst yeah right yes yes in america right yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how was it wow okay uh <laughs> it so the the job itself uh, it was something that i really wanted to to try and do for a few years I, because I ended up studying economics and uh, business finance in undergraduate. So in, my, in the college that I went to in Kentucky, that's what I studied. And I, you know, got really interested in 
the stock market. I was really curious about how the economy works. You know, I was just so, um, I guess, ignorant about it when I just began my studies in college that once I took an economics class in college, I was hooked. <laughs> that was just that was just such a big uh, point of interest for me. So, you know, fast forward a few years after I graduated from college, um, I worked for one year as a project manager for a startup in San Diego. But then um, I kind of kept my eye open for jobs and financial services. And this job came up to work as a business analyst. Um, yeah. I was in New York at that time. Um, so yeah, again, lots of places, lots of uh, accents, lots of people. Okay, um, but yeah. then at a certain point, you decided to become an English teacher. And how yeah. so? What made you decide to change your career? Yeah, so I have this thing that I like to tell people. I'm, I, I'm not the one who came up with it, but uh, people are like onions. They have a lot of layers <laughs> to them, <laughs> you know. Basically, um, you know how I told you that the business analyst job was something that I wanted to try out for um, a few years? I did, just didn't know if I'm going to like it, if I'm going to enjoy it. And after a point, it got a little bit to the point where I just said, okay, I've had enough of it. I think... Um, I don't want to keep pursuing this for much longer. And uh, I want to do something that is fulfilling, makes a difference. Um, and it's something that I am a lot more passionate about. Because when you're working in corporate America, you're no, not doing it for the, you know, for the good of the public or anything like that. You're doing it, let's face it, to earn money and at the end of the day, you're just making more money for the, the big corporations. <laughs> and, um, and I just wanted to, I guess, give back through me teaching. That was kind of the, um, the idea. It was like very um, altruistic in a way. You know, I want to just do good in the world. And this was all like, I think, 2000. 19 2020 is when th those ideas were really brewing in my in my head yeah and it's beautiful because you became fluent in english and that was sort of not enough right you want to yeah. teach others and help them and that's where your idea came up to take the celta right yes what is the celta so uh, the CELTA is uh, a type of uh, teaching English as a foreign language uh, certificate. It's kind of a, I would say, a brand name of its own. But at the end of the day, it's just a TEFL certificate. And TEFL stands for teaching English as a foreign language. And it's basically a very common type of a certificate that anybody who wants to teach English typically, you know, in a non-English speaking country, um, let's say in Japan, South Korea, or somewhere in Europe, let's say in Spain, they need some sort of a, a certificate to prove that they have, have some sort of a baseline knowledge of how to prepare lessons, how to conduct themselves during class and, and so on. So it's just a... It's, it's a certificate, it's a TEFL certificate that kind of proves that you have the, the basics. So but just the basics. But that, that means you did not have any experience as a teacher, but you decided to, to get a, a CELTA certificate, right? Yeah, yeah, I had no experience and the CELTA doesn't require you to have, um, to have any experience before you join. Um, I I think I just checked right before our interview, I checked that the requirement for your uh, fluency level, I think it's a C1 level or, or higher. So um, they're not even telling you that you must be near native fluent or anything like that. So it's totally fine if you're, I mean, 
in in my point of view, actually, it's actually better <laughs> if you are not a native level uh, speaker, or if you're if you're not a native speaker, if English is not your first language, mm -hmm. because if you've learned English as a second language yourself and you're going to teach it, I feel like in a way you have this advantage. You understand what it's like to struggle with English. Um, yeah, you know, that makes completely sense. And yeah. as a matter of fact, yes, you, you did like a diary, right? So it yeah. was six episodes long and uh -huh. I found this uh, quite interesting to watch just to Thank get you. the idea or, or to see what, what you went through, kind of. And I remember that I think it was episode two or so, where you were very tired. It was about 3 a.m. in the morning and you were explaining that <laughs> that you made an assignment. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> was it difficult or first maybe you can explain, was it an online course or was it an in-person course? Yeah, let me try to give as much background information so that the listeners and the viewers have an understanding. The idea for me initially was to take the CELTA course in person um, on a part-time basis in New York. And I did all the paperwork, I signed up for the course, I even paid you know, all the fees for the course. And then March 2020, COVID-19 has just hit like crazy. So most businesses in New York just stopped providing their services, apart from some essential businesses, obviously. And um, this CELTA course provider just told us that they're no longer doing the course. So they refunded me all the money and uh, said, okay, maybe we'll do an online version of this course, but we don't know. So I took my money back and I started looking <laughs> for, for other ways to, to accomplish this. Um, the thing about the CELTA is they're really trying to position themselves as they say it themselves, gold standard. And again, gold standard wasn't air quotes for all the people yeah. listening through audio. <laughs> gold standard of the TEFL certificates. And in that sense, they are, for, for the longest time, they've never offered like an, a fully online CELTA course, not until 2020. And um, the CELTA is, is different from other courses in that they, um, I don't even know where to begin. And I definitely don't want to sound like a salesperson for the CELTA. But CELTA, just to give you an idea, for example, a lot of the courses, money-wise, for example, I have to pay for the course in New York about almost $3,000 for a 12-week part-time in-person CELTA course. Um, I told you that all that money got refunded to me. I uh, started looking for new courses. I found one online um, given by an organization in London for... I think it was $1,800, so still quite expensive, but it was mm -hmm. fully online and it was on a part-time basis for 12 weeks. Most other courses... Also CELTA, right? Also yeah. CELTA, yeah. So I stuck with the gold standard, yeah. <laughs> so to speak, because I wanted to see, okay, what is it like? What is it like? What's the gold standard like? Because I was thinking of this almost as like an investment in myself, an investment in... Who knows, maybe down the road, I was thinking of starting a language learning business or some sort of a language school or, or I was going to be a language teacher. So I wanted to get the best education I can, right? Best is a subjective thing, right? I mean, just because you are taking the, the most expensive course doesn't make you automatically the best teacher. There's so much more that you need to do so much more learning that you need to do on your own. So completely, I, I totally don't want to sound like just because you take the CELTA, you know, you're automatically great. No. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think you mentioned something like the CELTA is more hands-on, right? It's more practical yeah. than, than other yeah. certificates. And also you made 
a great emphasis on uh, the feedback culture mm -hmm. on the CELTA. Yeah, so, and I can touch on that. Mm -hmm. I think it was quite a challenge to do it all online. Yeah, it was, it was. Um, and it was at the time when people weren't really used to doing everything on Zoom. It was really, I think, I think April or May 2020. So it wasn't like now when we've gone yeah. a year and a half or so uh, with doing online classes in university or whatever. So yeah, it was um, it was a little challenging from a technical point of view because uh, a lot of the people enrolled in, in the course with me um, weren't the most, I guess, technologically savvy people. And um, one of the requirements of the CELTA is to do six hours of supervised teaching practice. So what that means is by the end of the course, you, in my case, it was eight lessons. I think they were like 45 or 15 minutes long each. So if you do the math, somehow it comes out to eight lessons. But that was one of the deliverables, you know, for you to get the CELTA certificate officially to be certified. There was other stuff like uh, you had to uh, do weekly exercises, like weekly assignments. There were also uh, four written assignments, like essays, mm -hmm. essay type things that you had to do and they're graded. And uh, just kind of a side note here, they're graded not only by your teacher, but there's also some sort of an external um, assessor or some person from outside of the organization who really kind of makes sure that, that the teacher is grading things properly. So there's a lot of this emphasis within the CELTA on, on quality uh, assurance. For this reason, a lot of people, when they hear, oh, CELTA, you know, mm -hmm. that means quality in their, in their head. The other big reason why, um, I guess, CELTA has this reputation of being the gold standard is um, there is no, I guess, for all the TEFL certificates, there's no one single, like, unifying accreditation body um, that says, okay, this is a legitimate certificate uh, course for the TEFL and this one is not. There's like, I don't know, five or probably more um, okay, yeah. different ones. And uh, the CELTA uh, is associated with what's called Cambridge English Language Assessment, which this in itself is, a, so it's part of the Cambridge University or something like that. In a way, it's linked with Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. And obviously Cambridge University, there's like, <laughs> It's one of the best in the world. So people, again, think, okay, quality. But if you and I, for example, wanted to start a TEFL certificate, you know, Daniel and Eugene TEFL do course, <laughs> you know, like we could do that. And what's kind of messed up is you go to one accreditation body and if you don't get accredited through them, I see. no problem. <laughs> you can go to the next one and they're probably going to accredit you, you know? so. There's that sort of um, um, issue with these TEFL certificates, because all of them are 120 hours uh, of coursework. Um, all of them have maybe like the same exact or similar material type, but, you know, not all of them are accredited by an organization that's linked to Cambridge University, right? Not all of them have this teaching practice that's supervised. Um, a lot of them do have like a teaching component, you know, you must teach this many hours to get the certificate, but a lot of them, it's not supervised teaching. And yeah, uh, the teacher for the CELTA course, uh, that is a person who has years, sometimes decades of experience being an ESL um, teacher. So they give you feedback at the end of each uh, lesson you teach and they tell you, okay, maybe your introduction wasn't on point this time. Maybe you needed to, to do a better job giving instructions. Maybe, I don't know, you were too wordy in this uh, explanation. Maybe like all of that stuff. So they give you, give you feedback, um, but then you yourself also have to kind of, I guess, analyze your own performance and send that to your teacher too. 
and they look at the things that uh, you wrote about yourself and okay. they kind of give you feedback okay okay i think you picked up the right thing here like you yourself realize yeah. that you need to do a better job here and here but maybe you also need to work on this so there's a lot of this back and forth going i think a video that i recorded i i said in one of them that a lot of people think of celta as uh, busy work <laughs> yeah and i think i just told you all these different things that i had to write and uh, do and yeah it's a lot it's a lot of papers to submit a lot of uh, you know forms deliverables but in the end there is a reason for it all and if you kind of approach it from this point of view that well this is really me trying to learn from all, all the small things then you know you don't look at it as busy work you look at it as just a step towards getting better and do you think that you missed out on something because you did the course online i, I just give you an example I imagine that if it is in person, the course, then you have some sort of a, of a community feeling with the mm -hmm. other peers and so on. Yeah. And I assume that there were no connection among the participants or maybe only loosely, I guess. Yeah. I mean, we tried to have a kind of a Zoom um, meet up in the middle of the, the course just to kind of talk about things. Um, at the end, we had like a Zoom party <laughs> because I was in New York at the time and most of the people who were enrolled in the course were from um, England or um, Europe. So there was also the time difference for me. I really feel like, yeah, there I missed out on on the community feeling that mm. you're saying. Yeah, there was a, a lack of that. For some people, it's enough to just like work on a group project, for example, because there I think there is one or two kind of a group activities that you have to plan with your um, colleagues. And um, for some people, that's enough, right? Some people mm. they just want to be done with it, close their computers, <laughs> and go, go go on with their life. And I was also working full-time at the, at the time of taking the course. So I might have been <laughs> in that category of people <laughs> who just wanted to be done. <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I guess that this was also a real challenge to, to organize stuff, to, to yeah. go to work and, and yeah. to, to give lessons at the same exactly. time. To go to work to manage the whole time difference thing because the people oh, who, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the people you're teaching to, they're also on different time zones. Um, yeah, time management is huge when it comes to, to the mm -hmm. CELTA itself. Even if you're taking it full time um, and that's all you do, just the CELTA, you still have to know how to manage your time because they actually spell it out on the, um, the website it's the certificate itself is 120 hours but in addition to that there's about 80 hours or so of uh, of time that you need to allocate for you know preparing for uh, lessons yeah. for uh liaising with the other colleagues uh of yours because this teaching practice it doesn't happen in a vacuum so to speak you are actually allocated i think call it i don't know two hours or so and in this two hour time frame there's like three people teaching one after another and so you need to uh when you're planning your lesson you need to not only plan your own section but you need to understand what's going to happen after you teach because a lot of some of the activities are actually linked oh, or see, they're like yeah. a building block for the next person's uh, teaching part. So you really need to coordinate. And if you go over time in your part, then that impacts the next person who is teaching. So yeah, you have to yeah. plan and, together. And then all of a sudden a person drops out and then oh, you have to take yes. over. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
Wow, you really watched my stuff. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Daniel here is uh, alluding to the fact that in one of my videos, I mentioned that one person in my course uh, had to drop out for, for a good reason, for a personal reason. And um, the decision that was made that her slots that she was supposed to teach uh, were just distributed among the, the people who... Um, ended up staying on the course. So it's an extra, you know, it was an extra slot that I had to teach. Um, some people might think that, oh, that's extra work. And it was extra work, but I tried to kind of go with a positive mindset that's, well, extra experience, extra yeah, feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Were there any troubles or, or worries about taking the CELTA course? Yeah, let me think about this worry. Um, well, I don't know. I everybody who is taking the CELTA really understands that it's an investment. It's a big chunk of money that you have to pay for it because you could have easily taken a course somewhere else for probably a thousand or even more dollars less. And um, a lot of those people are working professionals or they are teachers who just want like more professional development or they just want to have another qualification in my case it was just like a, a weird time in my life i don't know if weird is a good word maybe uncertain is the the better way to put it i really wanted to quit my job but i still didn't have an english teaching job uh lined up yet so i was just in this transition and it was very i guess um uh, worrisome to, mm. to be in that position, uh, which is why I took the part-time course. I didn't, um, you know, just, just jump into it and quit the job and then enrolled in this full-time course. I think you set your own goals very high, right? Because I, try. <laughs> I get the impression that you want to reach a lot at the same time yeah we, we can yeah. see that also with your youtube channels or projects be because there are uh -huh. so many and you are making videos about playing the guitar you you are making uh -huh. interviews i feel like you are everywhere <laughs> <laughs> and, and learning french learning yeah english I, and, and <laughs> i try i try and the thing with that is sometimes um I guess you just have to stay more focused on fewer things than everything. You know, it's just like hard. It depends on the person, of course. Some people are better at managing multiple things at the same time uh, compared to just one. Um, I'm learning that I think I like having multiple things laid out, but I need to know what is the priority. And for me, I decided about six months ago or so, I really wanted to focus on my YouTube channel, which I renamed Lingo Junkie. And I'm focused on making videos about languages and my own experience with, with English, with Russian, with uh, making oatmeal, <laughs> sometimes in a funny way, sometimes in a more serious way. But yeah, I'm trying to also help other people get into college in the US. I have other hobbies too. I play the guitar. I try to make music. It's, you know, all at a very hobby type level. But um, yeah, I guess I like doing things. I like learning <laughs> about things. Do you want to add something to the CELTA? Maybe what, what is your takeaway? What did you yeah. learn the most maybe? Let me see. Let me look at my notes real quick. Because I also prepared and I took some notes. <laughs> I have my sheet here. Yeah, I mean... I guess I would just add, to conclude with the CELTA, I would just say that if you want to teach English in a country where English is not the, the main language, getting TEFL certified is probably the number one thing that you need to do. There are many different certificates that you can, that you can take, and CELTA is just one of them. It's a, an expensive one, so you know we have to kind of watch your budget. There are plenty of other certifications that are, I think, 
great and probably just as good. I would say that at the end of the day, the Celta is another business. You know, they're in it to make money at the end of the day. And of course, they're going to brand themselves and say all kinds of great yeah. things about themselves to get more clients, get more customers. And that's okay. That's fine because they do deliver on it. They do have um, things that other certifications don't have. But I would say if you are in this um, English language uh, world for a short period of time, if you're going to do it only for a year or two, maybe a CELTA is not going to make that big of a difference for you. If you're going to be in an English teacher for the long term, then probably it's worth investing in, in a CELTA. I wanted to add that in Switzerland, I looked it up. It is uh -huh. $3,500, the CELTA. And yeah. As always in Switzerland, everything is uh, more expensive than in other countries. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> a lot of the European countries, if you want to teach there, then it's going to be CELTA or the Trinity, TESOL. Mm. Those are going to be very much sought after. In places like South Korea, for example, it doesn't make that that much of a difference. Some employers don't even know the difference between okay. the CELTA or the TEFL. So you really need to know, I guess, the market that you're going into. And, you know, the CELTA on their website, they do make claims like two out of three employers are requiring the CELTA or yeah. something like that. I read that too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I don't know, in my job search, I haven't seen that much of a need for the CELTA um, in jobs that are somehow related to the CELTA organization, then yeah, of course, they're going to require their own certificate. But like I said, it's all just, it depends. Don't just look at the statement that they themselves are making. It's kind of okay. the, the lesson. Of course, I will put the link to the Celta Diaries, so you can watch oh, thank you. and learn about uh, Eugene, the experience yeah. when he was taking the Celta. It's really interesting. And, thank you. And also, he made a blog post about the Celta, and it is also very interesting. So let's move on to, to Lingo Junkie, right? Your, yeah. your flagship on, <laughs> on YouTube. Can yeah. I say that, or is it not true? <laughs> It's definitely something that I'm going to do for a very long time, probably until I die. <laughs> you know, languages, I don't know, the, the name might change in the future, who knows. But this is what I'm really putting a lot of energy into. And um, yeah, I guess my flagship project, sure, we can call it that. And what exactly means lingo? Could you explain? Us? Yeah. I think it's just a funny way of saying slang or jargon. Um, I think in English at this point, this is a, like a legitimate word. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure people, at least in conversation, they use the word lingo to mean like, oh, that's like that type of a language. You know, that's oh, that's lawyer lingo, you know, like, oh, that's something, yeah, like something that... Jargon, like jargon. jargon. Exactly, exactly. So I like to keep things pretty lighthearted on my channel, you know, just making educational videos, but at the same time, kind of presenting them in a, in a happy mood and kind of um, uh, sometimes unorthodox way, uh, like explaining different um, expressions from Russian by cooking oatmeal and showing you something that's part of my oatmeal or my breakfast routine. <laughs> yeah, that's just, you know, in a way, I, I like to think of uh, this YouTube channel as me um, teaching languages or sharing something about my culture. On the one hand, educational things, but on the other hand, just fun you know just having a good time and uh, being very welcoming to you know everybody who who wants to learn and or just wants to check some of those things out 
Yeah, and the tagline is actually keep calm and study languages. And first I thought it was just a language channel, right? But then I learned that it's way more than that. As I mentioned before, there is a flock, a diary flock, and it's way more than only language learning. I mean, we can see a little bit into your life, right? It's like you are sharing your experience with us and, uh, mm -hmm. and also giving some explanations in tutorials and reviews. Yeah. Also about, it's like, a, I don't know which word we can use. Like uh, in German, there is, is a word which is pretty cool. Eine Wundertüte. There are sweets Ooh. in it. You, you, you buy it, oh. right? And you don't, you don't know what is in it. And, and... Oh, that's cool. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm going to have to um, look that up. Wundertüte. Um, I, um, I guess there is a backstory to the, the channel and everything. When I started the channel, it was uh, simply a vlog that I wanted to do about the things that are happening that I'm learning in my journey, really. So if you look at my first video that I published, I think it was just a video about how I got my first job out of college. I think that's probably the first or second video that I published. And uh, a few videos after that are um, me just talking about, you know, my life in New York or how I was um, learning about a few things to make travel more affordable. I mean, it was kind of all over the place. I like making videos. That's just something that from an early age, I think since I was 14 or 15, I just kind of just loved um, the process of shooting video and then editing it, especially editing. I really enjoy that. Um, and I was experimenting with a lot of different things like vlogging. And I was trying to document my whole like search for a job in South Korea process, which I ended up getting a job. I never mentioned that, but ended up declining a lot of those because I ended up going to graduate school. Long story. But last summer, I essentially said, okay, I don't know if I love doing just the vlog. Let me focus on languages. And uh, this is what uh, Lingua Junkie is now. It's, uh, it's language stuff, but with a little bit of a uh, twist to it. With a little yeah. bit of a uh, wunder tutte. <laughs> or exactly. I don't know that, <laughs> <laughs> and that word. I noted down also... This comes from vlog number 18. In this episode, you mentioned that you also made a daily blog as a personal challenge back mm. in the day with the help mm. of your mobile phone. And then you mentioned that this was quite hard. It was a challenge. I think you did it every day. And then I don't know if you continued with it. I ask myself if, if you did it also to, to become a better English speaker, right? In, in the sense that you re recorded yourself and then you, you listened to it to yeah. sort of to improve. Yeah, I do think that that was part of the reason. Um, in a way, I think listening to yourself, the way you speak helps you with your fluency in English or whatever other language you are studying, um, definitely the case uh, with me, you pick up certain things that you don't really notice when you um, just speak the language without recording yourself. So mm -hmm. yeah, you, it really helps with your pronunciation, um, but sometimes it helps you with your you know, grammar or other things. You realize, wow. I really made that mistake. I really shouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and another episode that stuck with me was about Happy Friday. Maybe oh, yeah. you, you could tell us more <laughs> about it because I, I find this pretty lovely. <laughs> oh, thank you, Daniel. So the um, phrase that I learned once I started working in, you know, working full time after college is uh, Happy Friday. On Fridays, people, when, when they come to work, usually they say that to their colleagues. And 
I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It's actually kind of a positive thing to say to your peers, right? Um, but I was always kind of uh, looking at it from a different point of view. I was thinking, well, I hear Happy Friday on Fridays, but then people are so grumpy on Mondays, or people are so like, oh, it's, it's only Monday, you know? They have this thing in the US, um, they say that Wednesday is hump day. It's like, oh, we got to Wednesday. It's like, we're halfway there. We're, we're almost there. So it just sounded like, Bad. I don't like that. Yeah, it's sad. It's sad. I don't like that sort of an approach to life. I want to enjoy every single day of uh, my life, not just a Friday is happy to me. I want my Mondays to be happy. I want my Tuesdays, my Wednesdays, every single day. Of course, in a real world, sure, you have ups and downs, no problem. But um, in my head, I just felt like, man, like, I don't want uh, to be part of that. I want to at least try to make every single day you know, a, a happy one. So that's the reason for the for that vlog. Um, I'm sure some people might disagree with me or might find some of that stuff kind of cringy. In my first job out of school, I was kind of um, not enjoying what I do as much in my my job. So I shot that vlog, and um, yeah, I still I still um, agree with everything I said in that vlog. And I'm actually I actually <laughs> recorded a song or I'm going to record a song uh, on this same topic. Uh, I, I came up with it a little later, so I'm going to record a music video and um, it's going to be great. <laughs> so, yeah, if this is okay with you, I will put it uh, as well. Yeah, around. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's going to take some time for the song to come out. It's probably going to be another, I don't know, month probably or so. so you know, if uh, I, I might not have it soon enough for you. Oh, I song. see, I see, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. but you have many songs, right? I think about 10 or so, maybe. Yeah, I can I can share whatever other song you want with you and you can put that, yeah. And you have also other projects. Maybe you can quickly mention them and what they are. Yeah, so I have a project that I uh, created right after I graduated from uh, university uh, called Path to College USA. So this project um, is my way of helping other international students who want to come to the US to study. And right now it's very, I guess, at the beginning stages of the project. I have helped a lot of people just through one-on-one -on -one conversations, you know, through Skype conversations, through emails. But then I realized, what if I, you know, recorded interviews like these about people's journey to come to study in the United States, or maybe some of the advice that they can give about passing the TOEFL or the ACT or writing their essay, you know, because it's one thing when it's just me telling people what's best to do, completely different when there's all you know kinds of people from all kinds of all walks of life from so many countries sharing their experiences so so I created a YouTube channel for that with the idea to in the future make it a website you know with a blog with maybe a forum we'll see still kind of figuring out what's the core aspect of it but that's kind of a secondary priority for me right now because Lingo Junkie is is the main thing. I also make music in my spare time. Very, I'm a hobbyist when it comes to these things. I play guitar, I play a little bit of drums, very, very little piano. And uh, with a basic software like GarageBand or Fruity Loops these days, you can really do a lot of things. And that's what I'm doing, so. And what about the website thoughts on sticky notes oh well that one used to be the name of my blog which i still kept the name because i really like it now i've kind of transposed it to um uh, just my name eugenioperdon.com same website just housed yeah. under my that's simply uh 
I guess, a professional diary of the things I'm learning on my journey. So anything from, you know, career to um, business to just the books that I that I found very helpful. So, yeah, that one also I'm not very consistent with with posting blogs on that one because, you know, lingo junkie (laughs) takes time. And, and I'm totally fine with, with that. You know, I used to be very crazy about making it, making it all happen all, you know, mm-hmm. at the same time. But the reality is we only have so much time in the day. Time is limited. And if you really want to make an impact, I feel like you really need to know, like, what's your one focus. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't yeah. mean you have to say no to the other things. You can still continue doing them but maybe you'd allocate a little less time sure to sure so okay let's move on to the last section i wanted to ask you do you have any favorite expressions or idioms or a saying or something like that in english oh wow there's a lot of them uh, there's a lot of them and i'm gonna Say a quick uh, maybe anecdote. During that exchange year in New Mexico, I used to have a notebook with um, different slang words, different <laughs> <Awesome>. things <laughs> that I would learn. Yeah. And um, what I would do is whenever I would hear something funny or something cool that I wanted to keep using, and you know, it was a person right next to me who just taught me that thing, I would write it down in my notebook and then I would tell that person, can you please um, write your name and sign it? And (laughs) next time I use this phrase, I'm going to think about you. Mm. So it was just like a cute thing that I did at the time. And um, just thinking about some of those expressions, um, I I remember my uh, theater teacher, because I took a theater class and I was doing theater in in that year in in new mexico he taught me the phrase um you're off the hook meaning you don't have to do this you know you don't have to come to this meeting you maybe let's say you are free to go yeah you're free to go like maybe i told you daniel that like oh can you please come after we record this thing can you please i don't know hop on another call Mm -hmm. with me and Mm -hmm. we'll we'll discuss and then now I'm telling you, oh, you know what? I actually figured that thing out. You're off the hook. Yeah. 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 So this. I um, like that one. Yeah. That is great. Yeah. yeah. A lot of those phrases, just because it was high school and we were teenagers, were kind of dirty and probably mm. <laughs> not good to mention <laughs> on, on this podcast. Um, <laughs> some of them were just funny. And I just wanted to ask you if you could give some explanations for two or three words that you mentioned in your videos yeah and for for someone who has a channel named lingo junkie that's like what i do (laughs) you know that's that's the reason why i started the channel (laughs) so it would be cool if you could explain the expression and all of that jazz yeah sure so this one i also heard in new mexico during that exchange year and it's whenever you say something maybe you don't know how to end that sentence and Mm. uh, you just want to say and stuff like that you know it's very informal by the way so instead of saying and all that stuff and all that and that you say and all that jazz so Mm. if to give you an example maybe you know how we were talking about the CELTA. And so I would tell that, yeah, CELTA really helps you um, learn how to become a better teacher, but it also helps you manage your time. It helps you do all kinds of things and all that jazz, mm-hmm. you know, or, or maybe instead of all kinds of things, I would just replace it with and all that jazz and stuff, etc. cetera. Yeah, I, I like that pretty much, <laughs> to yeah. be honest. And yeah. This sort of expression would also come into your notebooks oh, yeah. right back yeah, in the I'm day. Pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere there. I actually Do found you... my notebook. Oh, I still cool, have it. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I still have it. I'm visiting my family right now and mm. I have a box of my stuff from 
back in Moldova from my college years. Mm. And uh, this is definitely something that I, that I had to bring with me. I'm pretty sure I have it here, actually. Um, <laughs> it's right here. So it'll be easy for me to do that. It's all yeah. stuff. I don't know if you can um, see very well. Um, but like these in red, these are signatures. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah. This is so and, cool. <laughs> and especially, uh, you can tell that these are teachers because they have red ink. <laughs> they have. Uh... <laughs> I imagine these days we would just record with our mobile phone Probably. To, Probably. to ask the person to repeat. And then <laughs> yeah, and it, it sticks forever with you because it becomes something personal, right? So yeah. it sticks. Yeah definitely better or yeah i'm sure you have for every expression you have some sort of um, story behind it right yeah mm -hmm. definitely yeah yeah exactly and also just with learning anything for me the process of writing it down just does something to my brain that mm -hmm. it just mm -hmm. sticks better <laughs> it just some there's something going on in that brain and it, it's not just language related my accounting teacher in college used to have these weekly assignments for us where um, he would ask us questions. Uh, we could find answers easily in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and he would uh, just tell us, okay, write it down. Like, explain that to me. Explain how this sort of uh, financial statement works. Explain it in your words. And you would understand things much better um, having done that written. Yeah. Things. And That's, you don't think of accounting as like a writing intensive thing, right? But, you know, it really applied even to accounting. Yeah, sure. And that's also why I like it to make the second podcast, The Woke Up Man, because I write down the expression. Mm -hmm. I try to find examples from mm -hmm. movies and, mm. and then I put them together and then I have three or four minutes with the focus of, of one expression so it will stick better and yeah. I can teach others as well through podcasting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Great. So, and the second one is to take it with a pinch of salt. Yeah. Um, so I really don't uh, like making uh, general statements <laughs> that are sort of uh, universal because there will always be an exception to everything in life, right? No matter what I say, again, going back to the CELTA thing, you know how I told people that, yeah, it's a great course, or let me actually think about it in a different way. You know how I said that the CELTA organization or the people who sell that course, they say that it's the gold standard. I would say that you should take that with a pinch of salt or with a grain of salt. Because don't just believe uh, word for word what people tell you. Kind of maybe think a little more critically mm -hmm. about it. Think mm -hmm. uh, about it, maybe analyze it a little more and, and filter it out. You know, maybe it's not 100% true. Maybe, maybe you need to kind of... Um, well, you, you need to, to make your own research, right? Yeah. Make your own research and don't take it at face value. Just mm -hmm. think that there's always going to be probably an exception to it. So kind of look at it maybe with like eyebrow going up. Like, yeah. Mm, but really, is it so? Mm -hmm. So take it with a grain of salt. Take every advice kind of yeah. with a grain of salt filter it through your own experience yeah. and make your own decision. It might apply to you, sure, uh, yeah. but it might not. And, and if it doesn't, then that's totally fine. That's, that, that's why we're human. <laughs> we're all different. <laughs> Sometimes we, you know, something works, something doesn't. It's thank really you good. so much. Thank of you. Of course. So and thank you too for everything. I really appreciate you. Uh, somehow, I guess, through the 
algorithm of Instagram, <laughs> yes. we found each other. Thank you for subscribing to the YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. Hey, All right. Eugene, ciao. Take care. Take care. Ciao, Daniel. Cheers. I'll see you. Cheers. Thank you. There was a time, there was a day when I used to have a job. What a time, what a day to have a job at all. Low unemployment, economy's booming, keeping depression so low. I try to be working, but people are talking, foodies are coming, beware, happy Friday. Friday, another week is passing by. What the heck have you accomplished? Happy Friday, happy Friday. Get the heck away from me with your corny ass review. And now it's time to go to lunch. Everybody's undecided where to eat.